Number 358 in the hymnal and also on the screen. remain standing for our chalice lighting and our covenant and I'd like to invite Ann Best from our choir to come up and light our chalice this morning. Enriched by our differences and joined together in our search for me, we covenant with ourselves and each other to see truth in the spirit of God, to strive for justice and to serve Please be seated. And now I invite you to stand if you wish to do so. And turn and greet your neighbor.
Good morning. I'm Joe Miller. I'm the worship associate this morning. And uh, we have several announcements. Uh, first, if you're viewing the service on Zoom, please remember that you can activate closed captioning if that's helpful. Uh, and if you'd like to talk with others after the service, there'll be a virtual coffee hour. Just stay logged in and you'll be invited to the breakout room. And if you're attending in person, please join us for Coffee and Fellowship Hall. Now, um, two announcements this morning. One is, um, okay. Two announcements uh, this morning. Uh, the um, first is, while well, last week was the official ending of our fund drive, if you haven't pledged, you can still do it. And we, we certainly would, would welcome that this year. Um, and then secondly, there's a table outside with a sign on it around uh, circle suppers. These are small group at, uh, gatherings for adults to share a meal and build community. Uh, and it's a pilot program this year. It'll happen in, I think, in uh, April, May, and June, Saturday evenings. Um, and uh, you can sign up, uh, whether you're a member or a guest, whatever. These will be very nice events, I think, for people to get together, maybe eight, 10 people to get together uh, and enjoy a meal together uh, and fellowship. And uh, you meet somebody new, maybe. Okay. All right. Please remain seated and join us in our centering so. Sunday, we gather together carrying whatever feelings we have within us. Now is the time in our service where we invite you to drop a stone into a bowl of water, symbolizing the dropping of your joys and sorrows, allowing those to ripple through our community so we can share those joys and share those sorrows together. You may come down the side aisle to the bowl of water and then go back to your seat through the center aisle. If you're joining us on Zoom, you may enter your joys and sorrows into the chat. Thank you.
I have dropped one last stone for those on Zoom and for those who cannot be with us this morning. Spirit of community in which we share and find strength and common purpose. We turn our minds and hearts into our circle of concern for all who need our love and support. Those who are ill, those who are in pain, either in body or in spirit, those who are lonely, those who have been wronged. We are part of a web of life that makes us one with all humanity, one with all the universe. We are grateful for the miracle of consciousness that we share, the consciousness that gives us the power to remember, to love, and to care. Amen. Let's sing Spirit of Life. Now it's the time for our offering, and we used to pass the collection plate, but in recent times, with the invention of the cell phone, we have found that you could text your donations, 20, 30, 40, 50, even more, to the number on the screen. And also there is a box where you can place your donation after the service, in the, uh, directly behind you as you're going out. So we invite you to help contribute to the good work of this church. Thank you. from our Universalist heritage. And it's a story um, about a real person, but I'm not sure that everything that happens in the story really happened. But sometimes we make up stories about real people and we imagine some things that could have happened. And this is by Janine Grossmeyer. So over 200 years ago, in a tiny cabin on the edge of the woods in New Hampshire, there lived a boy named Hosea Ballou. Now, Hosea was like any other kid, right? One thing I want you to know about Hosea is he loved to ask questions. He had so many things he wondered about. He wanted to know why and how of so many things. Do you like to ask a lot of questions? I like to ask a lot of questions. I like to know a lot of things. That was like Hosea. The other thing I want you to know about him is he loved to play. Do you like to play? I like to play. I definitely like to play. He liked to play inside when it was raining. He would play games and build puzzles. He liked to play outside in the summer. He would climb trees. In the winter, he would play in the snow. 
And in the spring was his favorite time of all to play because he loved to play in the mud. He loved to get ooey gooey mud squishing in his fingers and his toes. He loved to make puddles, like he would take water and make a big puddle and jump in it and splatter mud everywhere. He loved to make mud pies and build castles in the mud. He loved to play in the mud. Do you know who didn't love that Hosea loved to play in the mud? Well, Hosea's older sisters, he had a lot, he had nine brothers and sisters, and his older sisters were the ones in charge of the laundry. That was their chore in the house. And they did not love that Hosea wanted to play in the mud. So they went to their father and said, Father, we are tired of scrubbing mud out of Hosea's clothes. Because 200 years ago, they didn't have washing machines. That was a lot of work. We are tired of this. Can you ask Hosea to stop playing in the mud? So Hosea's father put on his very stern voice, and he said, Hosea, you must stop playing in the mud. And Hosea said, why? Because he had a lot of questions. And his father said, well, because it makes a mess, and in our church, we believe that God wants us to follow the rules and live a good, clean life. So we want you to not play in the mud. And Hosea, he wanted, to, he wanted to follow the rules. He wanted to obey his father and God. He wanted to live a good, clean life. And he tried so hard. He really, really tried. But see, the thing is, sometimes when you're doing chores, like maybe you're helping out in the garden or you're helping clean up the yard, sometimes when you're doing chores, you get a little bit muddy. And if you're already a little bit muddy, what is the harm in getting a little more muddy and playing in the mud? I think that's a fair question. So sometimes Hosea would get a little bit muddy and then he would get a little more muddy when he was playing. So his sisters went back to his father and they said, please tell Hosea to stop playing in the mud. It's just too much work. So Hosea's father called him in and he put on his very stern voice and he said, Hosea, you must stop playing in the mud. Hosea felt really bad and he looked down at the ground and he said, Father, are you very, very mad at me? And his father said, well, Hosea, I'm I'm disappointed in you. I'm a little bit mad. And And Hosea said, Father, do you still love me? And Hosea's father took away the stern voice and he said, Hosea, of course I love you. Of course I still love you. And Hosea said, even if I sometimes get muddy? And his father said, yes, even if you sometimes get muddy. And Hosea said, what about if I get really, really muddy? Like, what if I get mud in my hair and underneath my nails and in between my toes? Would you still love me? And his father said, yes. Hosea, I would still love you even if you had mud in your hair and in between your toes. And you know what? After that, Hosea stopped playing in the mud so much. He, he, was, he was following the rules. He was also getting a little bit older. And sometimes when you get a little bit older, you don't play in the mud quite as much. But Hosea still had a lot of questions. He kept asking questions. And when he was a teenager, he asked his father an important question. He said, Father, our church believes that only some people will go into heaven. Only some people deserve God's love. Just a small amount. Why is that? Hosea's father didn't have an answer to that question. So Hosea tried to find an answer. He read the Bible. He went to a universalist church. He listened to a lot of sermons. He asked a lot more questions. And when he was 19, he said to his father, Father, I have become a universalist. I believe that God's love is for everyone. I don't think that some people will go to heaven and some people won't. I think everyone deserves love. And his father said, Hosea, how can you believe that? That goes against everything we've taught you. That goes against what you've grown up with. And Hosea said, no, it doesn't. You taught me that even if I was muddy, you would still love me. I believe that God does that too. Even if we are good or bad, 
bad, whether we are clean or muddy, we all deserve love. Thank you for listening to my story today. All right, in a minute, Joy is going to play our sending song, and our children will go to their religious education classes. Joy will play through once, and we'll sing together. Then the second time, our teachers go into the lobby. The third time, the children do. Ari pickup is at 1045. Thank you. Poet Carl Sandburg was born in 1878, and as a child, he attended Galesburg, Illinois Swedish Lutheran Church with his family. In a chapter called Judgment Day, in his autobiography, he described a memory that illustrates the predestination theology preached in the church and the impact that it had on his family. He wrote, after dinner, we talked. Uh, the talk slowly shifted to the sermon of the day. Slowly, the talk got around to where the preacher had so solemnly told us nobody knows for sure who will be amongst the saved on the last day. It might be you. It might be him. It might be me. There would be loved ones separated some going to the blessed happiness of heaven, others to the everlasting fire. And then not only, but uh, suddenly, everyone at the table was in tears. Down our cheeks, the tears ran, and we looked at each other. It had never happened before in our house. We had seen mother cry once or twice, and us children blubbering plenty of times. But never the father. This was the first time we had seen tears in his eyes and running down his face. We children looked out the corner of our eyes. No one was either ashamed or proud. Had we not heard that loved ones would be torn apart on the last judgment day? My feeling one moment was that my mother looked at my father and believed there was no certainty that he and she would be separated on the last day, no one could tell. The matter of the faithful and the faithless would not be cleared up until the last day. So we wept in unison. Slowly we gulped and choked down the sorrow that had come suddenly and the sorrow that arose, that mystery of what judgment will be on us the last day. Now, there was one religious group in Galesburg that did not agree with predestination theory. Carl Sandburg wrote about this group as well. Mama spoke in hushed tones about the Universalists. I was eight or nine years old when uh, I asked her about them, and she shook her head with a grave face. She gave her ideas about the Universalists in two short sentences. They say there is no hell, and they believe in dancing in the church. <laughs> On the first point, I found she was correct, that universalists were saying there is no hell. On the second point, I learned that she had been listening to rumors. <laughs> 
I came to see later that most of the preachers in town spoke from their pulpits up against dancing, either square or round, while the Universalists said little or nothing about dancing, either in church or out, claiming that since there is no hell, you couldn't dance your way to hell. <laughs> We generally we don't applaud in our church, but uh, we know that you can't go to hell for applauding in church. So I'd like to welcome to our pulpit the Reverend Hosea Ballou. This Universalist Minister, Reverend Ballou of Boston, Massachusetts, he's agreed to join us today in media to answer a few questions. First, I want to thank you for being here with us this morning, Reverend. Thank you for coming. Thank you for Thanks having you. me. Uh, I must say, Reverend Ballou, given that you were born 252 years ago, you are in remarkably good shape. <laughs> Yes, I, I shouldn't have sent you my driver's license photo. It always ages me. <laughs> but I did die in 1852, and that kind of arrests the aging process. It slows it down. Yeah. Reverend Blue, I'm hoping that we can take the opportunity of your visit to learn about you and your involvement in the first years of American universalism. Absolutely, I'd be delighted. So I was born in April 30th of 1771 in a little town called Richmond, New Hampshire, uh, in British colonial America. 
I was the youngest of 11 kids. We didn't have Netflix or streaming services. Uh, my mother, Lydia, was 43 when I was born, and my father, Maturin, was 48. My mother died when I was about two, so I don't really remember her that well, but she came from a Quaker tradition. And my father, as was mentioned in the story, is a Baptist minister. And as part of his beliefs, he didn't believe he should be paid for his professional services. So the entire family had to go out and work for just the basic necessities. We worked on our own land, we worked on other people's land for food, um, and we do odd jobs for money for clothes. There wasn't a school in Richmond, and even if there was one, I couldn't attend it because I was so busy working. But as was mentioned in the story, I'm a naturally curious person. I want to know why, why? And so I learned to read from my father, and the only books that we had was a Bible, a spiritual pamphlet on the Tower of Babel, and uh, a, an old dictionary. And we couldn't afford quill pens, we couldn't afford real pens, and so I used pieces of birch bark and some coal that I got from the fire to actually start practicing my letters and then eventually writing. Uh, I had to do it all in front of the fireplace because we couldn't afford candles. And my laboring made me a really good athlete. I, I would like to run and I like to wrestle and I was pretty good at it. Well, if your father was a Baptist minister, how is it that you became a universalist? So my father taught the Calvinist belief that God anoints only a few to go to heaven. Um, and then everybody else goes to hell, whether you lived a virtuous life or not. And growing up, I'd have to say that I believe most Christians felt about one in a thousand people would be anointed to go to heaven, and then everybody else goes to hell. Uh, at the same time, the King of England was anointed by God to be king. And I saw the revolution reject that notion and instead put in place a democratic government established to replace the king. Um, I heard that I heard people begin to question that whole appointment, anointment. You know, is it really just a select few that go to he to heaven? And I really like to question religious doctrine, and and these questions kind of fit my own feelings. I had no fear of the wrath of the divine, at least not enough that I should, having been raised as a Calvinist. And after much study and around age 20, I came to believe in universal salvation. That is, everybody goes to heaven. Um, uh, reading my Bible convinced me of this more than anything else, and I know it displeased my father. I know he worried for my immortal soul, but we rarely spoke about it. One day, reading a book, my father said, is that one of those uni universalist books? And I said yes, and he had a very disapproving, uh, very disapproving look, so I picked it up and showed it to him that it was a Bible. <laughs> well, how did you go from... Being a, growing up on a farm and working in a farm to becoming a universalist minister? Well, ministering was a family affair. My father was a lifelong minister, my older brothers were ministers, and they got together and convinced me I needed to go preach. Now, in the Baptist tradition, clergy had no formal schooling. There were, there were no divinity schools. You learned by watching other preachers, copying what they did, and, and developing your own style. And so in 1791, at the tender age of 20, with no experience, I agreed to try preaching. Well, how did that go? In your modern day parlance, you'd say I choked. I was very nervous. I, I announced the Bible scripture. I read the text. And then I looked up to address the congregation. Nothing. No words. Totally broke down. Well, what happened? Well, one of my brothers had to come and escort me from the pulpit. And then he came back and actually read the sermon. How did you feel after this experience? Well, depressed and discouraged, of course. But my family and my friends got together and they continued to try to convince me. They pointed out that many great speakers of our age started out just like I had. They choked at the first attempt. Um, and, and I applied my love of learning to teaching myself to speak extempore. So this helped me develop a style of preaching without any manuscript or notes. Well, then did you go and serve a church? Not at first. Uh, during the winter season, I earned a small income as a school teacher. Uh, in the summer season, I was an itinerant preacher. I wore homemade clothes. I worked a small plot of land for my food. 
food. But when I preached, I would travel there on horseback. I spoke in meeting houses, orchards, uh, barns, private homes, anywhere people would listen. Uh, and again, as I remind you, in my time, there was no Netflix, there was no streaming movies, so singing hymns and preaching was the most popular form of entertainment. I spoke in many different situations and to very different minds, and that helped me hone my ability to, to debate and argue doctrine. And extemporaneous speaking helped me be more persuasive because I could really learn how to react to the audience, re react to our congregation, and, and speak to them as plainly as possible. May, may I ask a more personal question? I'm sure the members of this congregation would like to know something about your family life. It always Can gets a little personal. A little bit about your marriage? Sure, absolutely. So I married a woman by the name of Ruth Washburn in Worcester, Mass. In September 15th of 1795, she was 17, I was 24, no judgment. We had five sons and four daughters. And if I may brag a little, my son, Mature and Mary, wrote an excellent biography on me in 1854. I was married for 55 years until my death in 1852, and then Ruthie followed me a year later. I understand you began to develop your universalist theology beyond what uh, had been taught by the first universalists in America. What when did you begin to break away from the ideas of other universalist preachers? I was probably about 28. I, I began to really form this idea that Jesus was a great and special human being. His, teach, his teachings we should probably follow. But I just couldn't accept the idea of the Trinity. I, I couldn't understand Jesus being both God and his own father. And there was no biblical evidence that I could find to support any of that. Um, I just believed that Jesus was a special messenger of God. And I also began to understand that from my interpretations of the Bible, that there was really no hell or devil. And the New Testament seemed to suggest that hell was here on earth. It, it was the pain that we suffered through this life. Well, these two ideas, that the Trinity did not exist and that there was no hell, must have put you at odds with the other universalists of that time. Absolutely, absolutely. Most universalists totally accepted the Trinity right out of turn. They believed that sinners would go to hell for a period of time uh, and then go to heaven. So it was almost like a universalist purgatory. Uh, it, hell was supposed to be temporary but reformative, and God would like jail sentences, apply certain time limits to the, depending on how bad the transgression was. Um, but I said that punishment actually happens in life. If, if you choose poorly, you're going to suffer the consequences. And suffering that consequence is, uh, is that pain, you know, is, is that retribution. And so I believe that when we died, we were embraced by a loving God and taken to heaven. By the time you were 28, you were a guest preacher at the First Universal Society in Boston. And I've heard that on that occasion you got in trouble for expressing your views about the Trinity and about hell. You heard about that? <laughs> All right, so John Mary, the minister, went away on a trip and asked me to fulfill on the, for, for him at the pulpit. But that was my first mistake. Murray was the founder of the first Universalist Church in America, and church members held him in great regard. Now, he was traveling, but his wife was in the congregation. She hated my sermon. As I concluded my words and was giving the final prayer, Mrs. Mary wrote a note to one of the choir members in the front of the church. And just as I was about to speak the final prayer, that choir member stood up and said, I wish to give notice that the doctrine which has been preached here this afternoon is not the doctrine which is usually preached in this house. Whoa. Whoa. So what did you do? Well, I said very simply, the audience will please take notice of what our brother has said. And then I announced the, the hymn. Later, the parish committee apologized for the incident. You also faced more serious opposition to your universalism from the larger community. 
Oh yes, so I recall the general, collect, uh, the general convention in Woodstock, Vermont. Now the county had granted us the privilege of the courthouse to use for our meeting. And when we arrived, the sheriff was standing there, sword in hand, determined to keep out anybody so depraved as to believe in universal salvation. So what happened? Well, all I could think of was a similar incident that, that Jesus had faced. I looked the sheriff squarely in the eye. I quoted Matthew chapter 26, verse 52. Put up again thy sword into its place, for all that, they, the, all that take up the sword shall perish with the sword. The sheriff was so stunned to hear the words of Jesus addressed to him that he lowered his sword and stood aside and let us in. Well, you know, I find it interesting, Reverend Ballou, that throughout these early years of your ministry, you never had a full-time position serving a congregation. You were constantly on the road traveling from one church to another. When did you finally settle down? That would be about 1809. I was 38, and the members of the Universalist Church in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, called me as their settled minister. Now, this was the first time I was a settled minister, and I found this, the experience way different than the circuit preaching that I had done. Preaching at different churches every Sunday meant I could say what I wanted and then just move on to the next church. <laughs> Serving the same church month after month, year after year, meant that I had to deal with the politics of parish life. Uh, over time, some people came to dislike my ideas, my, my style of preaching, even my personality. The congregation couldn't raise enough funds to pay my salary. Uh, at the annual meeting, they actually tried to cut off my salary altogether. In 1815, though, I went to serve a church in Salem, Massachusetts, and there I experienced pretty much the same problems. Mm. Those must have been difficult times for you and your family. Yes, when I left the Salem church, they still owed me a year's worth of salary that they never paid. Uh, it was, but it was a joy to be in Boston. I, I got invited to the Second Society of Universalists. They had just built this spacious building, sat a thousand people. I preached there three times every Sunday. In the mornings, all the seats were full. In the afternoons, the seats were full and there were people standing in the aisles. And by the evening, it was standing room only. Well, why were you so popular? Well, I'd have to say a lot of it is the message that I proclaimed, that God loves us, that we not need to fear God. Universalism is a religion of the working people that does not seek to cast fear, hatred, or suspicion into the world. Universalism is a religion for, for people who do not wish to divide, separate, or exclude people. Universalism is a religion for the common people who do not wish to deny hope, joy, and dignity to human beings by condemning them to hell. The power of this message is what drew people in. Well, I'm sure the message was important, but didn't your popularity also have something to do with your skill as a preacher? Well, I did tailor my language to the language of the farmer and the laborer. I talked about a loving God in a way that working people could understand. One, sun, one Sunday, I told the story of a boy who had heard his parents say that a universalist preacher approved of sin. So they told the child that the only way to prevent sin was to have the fear of hellfire and damnation. So finally, the child was allowed to go to a universalist meeting. And when he returned home, his parents asked him if he liked the preacher. No, was his answer. And he swore he'd never go to a universalist church again because his parents had said that universalist ministers would let him commit as much sin as he wanted to. But he told his parents all that minister could talk about was sin. He talked about it more than our preacher does. Well, was this the major criticism of universalism? That without a fear of hell, people would feel free to sin. Yes, yes, I, I think so. Calvinists had the stick in hand, right? It, it, without hell, you would just do whatever you wanted. You would steal, lie, commit adultery, get drunk, refuse to work. In the words of one universalist talking to a Calvinist, is that really what you want to do all the time? <laughs> I preach that if people committed these sins, they would suffer in life. I taught that sin created unhappiness in life. I believe that the happiest people were the people that avoided making those bad choices. Well, how, how did you get along with the Unitarians? Mm. 
<laughs> I, I have to remember I'm in a church. Uh, I'm sad to say the Unitarian minister snubbed me. Theologically, they were ambivalent about hell. But Unitarians were a different social class. They were aristocratic, they were snobbish, their ministers were all Harvard educated. They were contemptuous of unlearned universalist clergy. They called us crude, they called us vulgar, and I must admit, this rejection saddened me greatly. Well, how do you feel about the fact that in 1961, the denominations merged? It's about time they got their act together. No, I, I, I'm delighted. I'm also happy that the Unitarians no longer believe that hell exists. Well, Reverend Ballou, I'm afraid we're nearing the end of our wonderful time here together with you. To sum up, what do you think you accomplished during your life? Well, when I died in 1852, I could look back on 81 years of living, 60 years as a universalist preacher, 55 years of marriage and nine children. Again, no Netflix, no streaming. When I began my ministry, we had only a dozen universalist clergy and less than a thousand members. At its peak in the 1830s, universalist church was the ninth largest denomination in the United States. But I think what I most am proud of is that I helped free thousands of people from their fear of God. Well, before you depart, Reverend Ballou, are there any final words that you would like to leave us with today? Yes. As I look at the world of the 21st century and compare it to the 19th century, I see many changes. Today, most Protestant ministers have adopted some form of my message. On your television, you can watch preachers say that, they, that God loves you and so do I. And when I preached, I don't think anybody cared whether I loved them, but they really did need to hear that God loved them. Today, just as in the 19th century, educated, financially secure people do not worry a lot about whether God loves them. If you have a comfortable home, a healthy family, a good job, then the question of whether God loves you is not so important to you. A universalist minister named Thomas Starr King put it this way, universalists believe God is too good to damn them. Unitarians believe they're too good to be damned. I ask you, however, to take an imaginary trip to leave Delaware County, to go further afield throughout Pennsylvania, to the center, to the north, and in these areas where college education is the exception, not the rule, you will still hear these fire and brimstone, these hellfire uh, sermons. These people need to know that God loves them. They do not need preachers frightening them out of their wits with visions of everlasting damnation. They have enough real fear and real pain in their lives. They need to know there is no hell. And this is the message of universalism. Reverend Ballou, thank you so much for being here thank today. You. And can you stay for our second service? I, I will try oh, to get, thank you so I, much. I have to say, I don't know what these things are, but boy, they would have saved a lot of bellicose sermoning back in my day. <laughs> Let's stand and sing our closing hymn.
chalice, let us say our closing benediction together. For those who come to the God, 